Somewhere on Earth heads for the east coast of Australia, famous for its 10,000 kilometers of breathtaking coastline and for the boundless swell of the Pacific Ocean. Its shores also count 12,000 islands, islets, and keys, less well known but just as magnificent as their big sister, the island continent. For Darren, Lossie, and Claire, Eastern Australia is a wild, alluring El Dorado, and they're going to let us in on some of its secrets. From the history of its first inhabitants to the cutting edge of climate research, each one is fighting to protect a heritage that is as fragile as it is majestic. North Stradbroke Island, just a few kilometers from the glass and cement skyline of the Gold Coast, seems like an interlude preserved from human folly. It is a land apart. It belongs to no one, but the Kwandamuka Aborigines definitely belong to this island. Darren Burns is one of the 150 Aborigines that live here. Kwandamuka, you know, we are the people of the land and sea. Um, but, you know, you cannot say we feel more of one than the other. You know, we live on an island, so we're surrounded by sea, so obviously we're saltwater people. Um, but we need fresh water to survive. So the land part of our island gives us the fresh water, the food and the vegetation, the fauna and flora, and the spiritual entities that are surrounding us everywhere we go on this island, um, whether that be in the water or on the land. So that's our resource from the beach. Did we eat them? Oh, you can eat that. Very nice. Mm. Darren watches over his island and its treasure. He is the head of the island's Aboriginal rangers. Well, we'll go up here and we'll see if we can find some roos behind the dunes. I'll, I'll just run up and see if there's any up there. Uh. Come this way now, come up on the high. There, just there, see the baby in his pouch? See the little one? North Stradbroke Island is a paradise for kangaroos and koalas. There are no predators on the island, and a large part of it is a natural reserve. This is food for the soul, for sure. It's, it's therapy, it's, it's what you know, any traditional owner needs to be doing, is, is having that satisfaction and knowing that they're looking after their country. I belong to this place. I don't belong to somewhere a hundred thousand or a thousand miles away. I belong right here. So this is where I'm strongest and I, and I work from my strength and the strength of my people. We, we know it's our place. We, nobody can tell us any different. The arrival of the British colonists at the end of the 18th century marked the beginning of the massive expropriation and acculturation of the Aborigines. Darren has been fighting for the recognition of Aboriginal rights for over 30 years. 
July 4, 2011 marked a new page of their history. The federal court returned a large part of the island and the management of its resources to the Kwandamuka people. I didn't experience and suffer racism and discrimination as badly as the generation before me. You know, things are getting better as civilization, you know, the, the establishment becomes more civilized. You know, they, they've been uncivilized and treated Aboriginals poorly in the past, but it's getting better. So as such, the fire in my belly has been very strong, um, just from, you know, the, the injustice that our people suffered. But I see the young ones of today, the fire burns as strong in their bellies, but the young ones, their fire is born out of their pride in who they are. The dark days of the island are a thing of the past. And the focus today is protecting this magnificent heritage that has been passed on to them. The island, called Minjeriba by the natives, is a dune covered by forest and a coastal wetland, the 18-mile swamp, the only one of its kind in the world. In the dry season, wildfires can cause irreversible damage and threaten to destroy this extraordinary ecosystem with its centuries-old trees. Darren and his crew take constant care of their ancestors' garden. Our people in Australia and the Kwandamuka country, we manage the bush with fire for thousands of years. So our people and the vegetation are attuned to one another. And the effects of colonisation interrupted the traditional practices of the Aborigines, of our people. And really, this is a recommencement on a large scale of our people managing their country. Because for a lot of time, we had no rights or no resources to do this job. Now we've got native title. We've got the rights and the resources and the ear of the government to support this work and to listen to Aboriginal land management aspirations and, and practices. And we're working together. That's the big important thing too. Today's mission will be tricky. The rangers are going to set a controlled fire. No, 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 I guess the other side of that dead waddle there, see, don't bother too much, hey? Get it over there. We come inside that bark. Darren trains the young people of the community to become rangers. He passes on his know how a mix of tradition and science. Uncle Darren, as he's known here, is a well-respected figure. He, he keeps us at a pace that we wouldn't think that we could do. So at the end of the day, you'll work, you work your ass off all day. And um, if it wasn't for him, you know, he's in his 50s now, so if he can do it for eight hours straight, then so can us. The Aborigines have been practicing controlled fires for thousands of years. It means managing the fire's temperature, direction, and amplitude. This technique favors certain species of trees and insects. Animals can move about more freely. The soil is nourished and the bigger trees thrive. Most important, if a wildfire does break out, it spreads more slowly. Like in the summer of 2014, when North Stradbroke could have disappeared in an out of control bushfire. The rangers finally managed to stop it. Now, the scars are nearly invisible.
Craig Tapp teaches traditional Aboriginal arts. For a long time, the colonists banned any form of cultural expression. Without a written tradition, a great many native practices have been blotted from memory. Who wants to colour in a dolphin? Me, You'll be very, one ears at a time? Me. OK. You can colour in a dolphin because you've got smaller feet. done is I've, uh, I've brought it along so, so we can do it as a communal thing for kids, to get them out, out of the classroom, to get them back out in the nature, you know, to get them to touch the land again. And that, when, when they do that, they, um, something comes, something becomes, they, they, the, the glow in their face and their eyes, they just, they just love, they love, as you can see, they love connecting back to Bujangjara, to Mother Earth. Yeah. So that's what it's all about. That's what kids are missing. They miss that spiritual side and connecting back with Mother Nature and, and Bujangjara. And once you touch her, once you feel her, and you make something beautiful and design, and you get this great sense of achievement. And yeah, the kids love it. Yeah. These colours that I use, uh, the uh, red is for the uh, land, the black is for the people, the yellow is for the sun. The white is for uh, Bayami, our creator. Uh, I've also, this, these are our two Yuris, our two totems. You've got the dolphin and the snake in the centre, okay, which is land and ocean, which is one of the biggest things of messages we've got to get out there. It's very important to realise what we do on this earth reflects on the land, especially the land, reflects what happens in the ocean. So if we don't look after both of them, we could be in trouble, guys. Sand painting is a collective art. It was practiced throughout the continent. The designs served as a spiritual support during ceremonies and were meant to disappear. The sacred designs had to remain invisible, especially to the non-initiated. Revitalizing our culture is coming very strong on this island. We've lost all our ceremonies and most of our language, but most of it's revitalised. Um, and hope we can keep that going through the children and get stronger. The obvious wisdom of a 40,000-year-old people goes well beyond an image on the sand. And the Kwandamuka rangers are always on the move, on land and on sea. knowledge I acquired to enable myself to, um, you know, satisfactorily pass the requirements to get a marine studies um, graduate certificate um, 
is pretty much the knowledge that I've gained from growing up here. I worked for marine parks for 15 years also, so I did a lot of diving. I'm also a you know, scientific diver. I did a lot of diving, worked with a lot of scientific people. I, you know, my, my grandfather and my elders and my peers um, taught me so much and learnt so much about the marine environment together, just like Patrick here. Um, you know, we know we, we're saltwater people. We've lived growing up on an island, so we know our environment. You know, it's not like we're hanging around malls every day. You know, we're, we're hanging around the, the salt water every day. Darren and Patrick checked the condition of the seaweed beds and the coral after the passage of Cyclone Debbie, which devastated the east coast of Australia. The water, normally crystal clear, is murky with sediment washed down by the floods. The island offers a very favorable habitat for sea turtles and dugongs, two emblematic animals for the Kwandamuka. They live in the shallow waters that separate the island from the continent and are particularly vulnerable to the pressure of human activity. North Stradbroke is also a migration hub for the giants of the sea, like manta rays and whales. Once a year, the island has a front row seat for the largest migration of humpback whales on the east coast of Australia. At last count, there were 25,000 of them. So we're all ready to get in the jetty. Yeah. All right. Back at the station, preparations are underway for a week-long mission. In North Stradbroke, the young generation is ready to take over. There, yeah, Claudia, just do that, look. I must have jammed it, in there? Yeah. When you pull them out there, just like that. Hunting boat. Young Aborigines can join the rangers from the age of 16 and up. There are already a dozen following in the footsteps of Uncle Darren. The more that I can entrust it to them to carry out the work, um, the more that realisation of them being, you know, the leaders of tomorrow is, comes to fruition. So I can say, don't know what to do, and they'll be working with other people. Um, but, yeah, they don't need me with them for this one. And, you know, I, I can't be there every step of the way. They, they're on their feet now. Um, they can be depended upon. All right, fellas, have a good trip, eh? In North Stradbroke, the native title has given rise to a veritable renaissance for the Kwandamuka. Pride in their origins is also part of the lifeblood of Lord Howe Island, where the story of the first inhabitants is still being written. A veritable oasis in the watery desert of the Pacific, this island was for a long time unknown to humans. Located 600 kilometers from the coast, this land is far from everything. Now, 350 people live on this lonely, lush rock, 11 kilometers long and 2 kilometers wide. Lord Howe Island was discovered by accident in 1788 by a ship loaded with prisoners en route for the penal colony. The island then became a strategic spot where the whaling ships that crisscrossed the zone could take on fresh water and provisions. The first pioneers did not settle here until 1834. My 
great great grandfather was Nathan Thompson. He was a whaler from Massachusetts in America. During one of his whaling voyages, um, they sailed past the islands of Kiribati, where they saw two women in a boat. Um, one of them, who ended up being my great grandmother, um, was this running away from her dad, who was trying to make her marry someone she didn't want to marry. And apparently, she was a princess from that island. They took them on board and um, sailed, and they ended up coming to Lord Howe Island. Nathan decided, I'm going to set up my home here on this island and he became one of the first settlers. Then he ended up marrying Boku, who was my great-great-grandmother, and they had children together, which is how I got here and, you know, a lot of people on the island, yeah. Lucy Thompson is 27 years old. You could sat there for ages, eh, Dad? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like all islanders, she had to leave in order to pursue her education. Oh, she became a teacher on the continent, but her longing for her island home drew her back to her family. I love this smell. It, it definitely reminds me of home whenever I smell these seeds. Just um, springs back awesome memories of just feeding with Dad. This island just draws you back here. When I'm away, I definitely get homesick. Um, you always feel a bit guilty when you're not here in a way because you feel like sometimes like you are letting go of like a, a heritage that you have, like a, a connection, a tie that you have to this place. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Well, yeah, if it's like... Most of the inhabitants here are related. Kyla is one of Losi's many cousins. She's 20 and a mountain guide for the mountain. Enough. Kayla goes up like all the time. Enough not to yeah. bother counting anymore. Yeah, nah. Yeah. We used to when we were younger, I remember yeah. we used to count. I used to always like count how many times I went up, but then you just lose Yeah, track. I'm just over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your escape, yeah. your isolation, you know, you can have the whole place to yourself. It's somewhere we're on a small place where you see everyone all the time. It's somewhere you can go as a little sanctuary, refuge, yeah. There's no cell phone coverage on the island, no boutiques, no malls. The one road doesn't go anywhere. Rising 875 meters above sea level, Mount Gower is like a haven, a respite from the everyday routine. To reach the summit means a five hour climb covering five kilometers. Well, Mount Gower is special because it is, like, it's a home to, for example, these birds that are flying around right now, the Providence Petrel. It's, um, th these mountains are the only place in the world that they nest. They don't nest anywhere else. It's like a little wonderland up here. Yeah, it's completely different to anything you'll find on the lower land of the island. Um, yeah, you've just got so many uh, endemic plant species that are only found here. Um, and if you come up by yourself, it's, it's just you. It's just you and this place. So it's pretty special uh, to be able to have that interaction. Territorial birds. So if they hear a noise um, or someone around their burrow, they see it as a threat. And so 
they come in to suss out what's happening and to protect their territory. Yeah, but they're pretty inquisitive and then they're, they're not that aggressive as you can see. <laughs> in a way, we feel definitely a part of this island as much as the birds and the trees. Um, and I think I need to do my part in protecting this island so that it doesn't, you know, become like any other sort of resort, even protecting its natural um, flora and fauna to make sure it remains the beautiful island that it is. Losi has joined the weeding crew. Their job is to eradicate invasive plants. Lord Howe Island has been classed a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve on land and sea. Where are we starting? Uh, I think the last run is just there, look. They mark out the entire zone in a grid, then go over it with a fine-toothed comb. They've inspected each square centimeter of the island to stop the spread of ground asparagus, a particularly harmful species. Good one, Ernie. There we go. Got a groundy. The weeding program was started 14 years ago. They have already clocked over 40,000 hours of weeding. Bruce has been part of the group right from the beginning. When we started doing this, it was just everywhere, you know, like a, like a carpet of it. But um, in the areas where it was very thick, we had to spray using poison and spray it. We're the most dangerous species, highly invasive, that's for sure. But that's how, of course, all these weeds got here by man. Yeah. There's one down there. Okay, Lossie, how about we get you geared up? Over the top. Can be extreme at times, this job. That's what keeps it interesting and fun. Um, there's always going to be that challenge to get the last sort of sneaky weed but um, hence we're sort of looking at rope access systems, drones, and in the future we'll be looking to get uh, weed detector dogs, which are trained to sniff the scent of particular weeds. It's an enormous job and they take it dead seriously, for the ecological stakes are high. Lord Howe and its neighboring islets are home to little known and vulnerable species. Eighty percent of the noxious weeds have been removed, but the birds continue to spread the seeds. The team hopes to put an end to the problem in 15 years. But if even one harmful plant survives, this Herculean effort will have been in vain. asparagus will grow up in trees, like in the rocks, on the cliffs, everywhere they will just grow. Um, so it does seem like a bit of an endless task, um, but it's a really important one because like if these were to just take over the forest, I think, or the bush, it would just definitely um, be really devastating for the island.
Losi is getting back to her roots and is inspired by them for the songs she composes. In life's go and carve it on a tree or write it on the sea. You are my best friend. A lot of songs that I write um, are always me often longing to be at home. Um, you know, they're just songs about wanting to be in a place that I love with the people that I love on an island that I love doing the things that I love and is an awesome way to also share with people about Lord Howe as well um, about where I come from I think I come from paradise <laughs> I think we lost um, the beauty in simplicity, like with all modern day technologies, even the way like food is process like everything's designed in order for for us to um, get it done quickly have it now so that we can go to our you know shove things in the microwave press a few buttons and it's done so that we can then live and pack as much into our lives as possible and I think that just takes away just from the beauty of the simple things in life like standing under a few palm trees and cooking some fish in a fire and like not having the sound of a TV in your face and, you know, not having your phone here looking at Facebook or on Instagram all the time, like all that just taken away and just enjoying people's company. Yeah, that's what I think. Well said, well said Lassie. <laughs> well said. Sound of silence. Lord Howe Island is an enchanted interlude. Thanks to its isolation, the inhabitants have learned to be happy with the gifts of nature. Cape Tribulation, with its own Jurassic beauty, has been fascinating and intimidating people ever since man set foot here. Water. Tons of water. That's the secret of longevity of the Daintree Rainforest. 135 million years old, it's thought to be the world's oldest forest. Clouds coming from the Pacific end their voyage here, blocked by the barrier of the coastal mountain range. This forest covers no more than a tenth of one percent of Australia's total surface, hardly 1,200 square kilometers, but it is home to the continent's richest and most complex ecosystem. Claire Gelly is an entomologist. She left France and crossed the planet to pursue her passion for insects. She's 25 and working on her doctoral thesis at the University of Brisbane. 
In this lush primary forest, she's trying to uncover the secrets of bugs and their microcosm. I know that most people don't really like insects, buggy creatures, spiders and such. It's something that you learn to love. I've never been disgusted by insects. I've always found them pretty nice. And the more you learn about things, the more you can find beauty in them. Plus, there are some really magnificent creatures here in Australia. Brightly colored butterflies, 20 centimeters across, beetles that are fluorescent, blue and green. Yes, I find a certain beauty in insects. I remember when I was a little girl, four or five years old, I'd go into the forest and I was fascinated by the ants. I'd watch the ant colonies on the march for hours. I always liked science, understanding how things worked in nature and in general. I've always read a lot of books on the subject. The James Cook University has set up a research center at Cape Tribulation in the heart of the forest in order to study the climate. And they were thinking big. They covered half a hectare with tarps and drains to divert the rainwater and reproduce the effects of a drought on the forest. This experiment was set up two years ago. We can already see the effects here. The forest is not yet a desert, but it is becoming less dense, less lush. The leaves of the shrubs are a lot drier. They have less sap. These are the early signs that the forest is dying, that the shrubs are dying, that the tall trees are dying. Here the ground is very dry. Generally in a tropical forest, even when it doesn't rain, the ground is always damp. There is also less regrowth of the shrubs, except for here and there. Normally you have much denser growth. Insects have a very short life cycle. They are the first to suffer the effects of the climatic upheavals. By making projections into the future through this experiment, scientists are trying to come up with possible solutions to save the forest. Insects are drawn to light at night because they get their orientation by the moon and the stars. They mistake the trap for the moon and heedlessly fly towards it. When they get to the fake moon, which they never should have reached, they're confused, so they flutter about not knowing where to go until they're exhausted.
Une notion importante dans le changement climatique, c'est l'augmentation des températures. The increasing temperatures are an important aspect of climate change, but not the only one. Plus d'extrêmes, donc des événements comme les cyclones. The climate change will bring more extremes like cyclones and floods. We're going to have extreme temperatures of hot and cold. These extreme events endanger the species living in nature. Les espèces qui vivent dans la nature. For example, concerning entomology, we're now seeing that the pollinators are being affected. Without pollinators, we know that agriculture will suffer and there'll be a lot less food for humans in 20 to 30 years. Claire is also studying the impact of climate change on other species. The naturalist David White is helping her in her work. His sun-powered boat allows them to get close to the birds without frightening them. But the tropical forest is much too dense to do a visual count of the birds living in the heart of the forest. I've practiced so that I can identify about 200 different species of birds. Australia is home to about 800 bird species. I've learned to recognize mainly the birds of the forest and the east coast of Australia because this is where I work. A lot of birds are migratory. Their migration depends a good deal on the climate. Even the non-migrators tend to move about according to the food sources, which depend on the climate. Rainbow lorikeets live all along the east coast. They gorge themselves on fermented fruit, which gets them drunk. Then they behave very strangely. They hang from the branches, shove each other, and sometimes even fall out of the trees. To the great delight of the saltwater crocodiles, the most dangerous in the world. They can grow to nine meters in length and weigh over a ton. The bird eats the insect, the snake eats the frog, and the python eats the bat. Each species has its role to play in the tropical forest. There's two different types of bats in the world. There's uh, micro bats, which are the little ones that live in caves, and they come out at night and eat insects. Uh, these ones we have here are uh, called mega bats, and they're bigger and um, they don't have any echolocation, so they live outside. They can't navigate in the pitch darkness. In the rainforest they are very important and they are what they call a keystone species. So. Uh, Without our bats, we wouldn't have a rainforest. They pick a fruit off the rainforest tree and they fly along with it, sucking the juice out, and then they spit it out somewhere else. It's still going to grow, so it's very good at, uh, the bats are very good at regenerating the rainforest. They also get nectar from the flowers, so they get pollen on their fur, and then they go to another flower and cross-pollinate the flowers. So just as important as, as the bees. The Daintree River is a natural frontier. Cape Tribulation to the north is isolated, for there are no bridges leading to it. Man tried to tame it for a long time, but the torrential rains thwarted the many attempts. To carry out her research and better understand the mechanisms that govern the forest, Claire has hooked up with Joe Rakel, a botanist for the NGO Rainforest Rescue. Hector by Hector, the organization is buying up the fields and abandoned land in an attempt to erase the errors of the past. 200,000 trees have already been planted on 28 parcels of land. Yep, yep. This is the front of the block I've just showed you here mm -hmm. that we've planted. This is the section here 
when we planted the trees. So this is basically where we are standing. Where we're standing now, now yeah. That was six years ago. Six years ago. That's quite incredible. But can you see the, the difference? This is Iliocarpus or a Kwandong tree and it's six years old believe it or not. Uh, we stop measuring once they get past 10 metres but in six years it's exceeded it. The birds like it because you can see the seeds, seedlings, all the new seedlings have come up. This will take over and this is our new forest. Now you've got one, two, three, four, five species in an area that's like that so the diversity is just quite incredible. Saving this forest means giving a chance to the cassowary, the lord of Cape Tribulation. Its powerful claws and hefty weight of 70 kilos make it the world's most dangerous bird. Yet it is now in great danger of extinction. We work on a policy of there's no sense in saving a species unless you save a habitat, unless you put it in a zoo. So we're restoring the forest and the surrounding areas for it. It creates food for the wildlife and insects and birds, so nature's the winner. There is hope. The forest canopy has long been unknown territory to scientists. They tried a variety of ways of finding out what was happening up in the canopy. They used slingshots to knock down leaves from way up. They used bows and arrows to shoot cords above the canopy. It was really tedious. Now that we have a crane, there are about a dozen like it in the world, we can find out what's really going on in the canopy. And in fact, we realized that we have a very different biodiversity up here, and also a much richer one. This crane covers one hectare of forest one half of which is being deprived of water for the artificial drought experiment. Andrew Thompson escorts scientists who've come from the world over to study life in the canopy. All insects have six legs, all spiders have eight, but everything with eight legs is not necessarily a spider and everything with six legs is not necessarily an insect. A millipede belongs to the group of arthropods. There you have insects, spiders, millipedes, all the creepy crawlers that most people don't like. Every time she finds a little piece of flower or leaf that's not there, she'll take it off the web because it makes the web easier to see. Yeah. It's the little male spider just here. Ah, yeah. So this is the female, and then the males yeah, are the really, really tiny. small. <laughs> and she's probably half the size that she'll end up being by the time she's mature. When they have to mate with a female, they have to put her into a trance, so they'll actually climb onto her back and drum with their legs and sort of really relax her down so they can try and mate with her. Otherwise, she'll sort of go for them and eat them. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's really interesting. Cape Tribulation certainly lives up to its name. Unraveling the secrets of this forest that for 135 million years has stood up to the climate and man might give a chance of survival to all species. in ropes 
On a boat slowly drifting out into the sea Crying out, crying out, oh please deliver me I'd give all, I'd give everything just to be free To be free Ah ha, ah Ah ha, ah To feel my bed Sting on the warm hard rocks On those lines I'll be swinging Through the tall treetops Then my heart started singing From its cold dark box Let me be free 